Welcome to Nihilist Narrates, A Poet's Nightmare, by H.P. Lovecraft. Lucullus Languish, student of the skies, and connoisseur of rare bits and mince pies, a bard by choice, a grocer's clerk by trade, grown pessimist through honors long delayed, a secret yearning bore that he might shine in breathing numbers and in song divine. Each day his fountain pen was wont to drop, an ode or dirge or two about the shop. Yet naught could strike the chord within his heart that throbbed for poesy and cried for art. Each eve he sought his bashful muse to wake with overdoses of ice cream and cake. But thou the ambitious youth, a dreamer grew, the Anonian nymph declined to come to view. Sometimes at dusk he scoured the heavens afar, searching for raptures in the evening star, one night he strove to catch a tale untold in crystals deep, but only caught a cold. So pinned Lucullus with his lofty woe, till one drear day he bought a set of Poe. Charmed with the cheerful horrors there displayed, he vowed with gloom to woo the heavenly maid. Of Auburn's tarn and Yannick's slope he dreams, and weaves a hundred ravens in his schemes. Not far from our young hero's peaceful home lies the fair grove wherein he loves to roam. Though but a stunted copse in vacant lot, he dubs it Tempe and adores the spot. When shallow puddles dot the wooded plain, a brim o'er muddy banks with muddy rain, he calls them limpid lakes or poison pools, depending on which bard he fancy rules. Tis here he comes with Heliconian fire on Sundays where he smites the attic lyre. And here one afternoon he brought his gloom, resolved to chant a poet's lay of doom. Rogat's thesaurus and a book of rhymes provide the rungs whereon his spirit climbs. With this grave retinue he trod the grove and prayed the fawns he might a poet prove. But sad to tell, ere Pegasus flew high, the not unrelished supper hour drew nigh. Our tuneful swain the imperious call attends, and soon above the groaning table bends. Though it were too prosaic to relate the exact particulars of what he ate, such long-drawn lists the hasty reader skips, like Homer's well-known catalogue of ships. This much we swear, that the adjournment neared, a monstrous lot of cake had disappeared. Soon to his chamber the young bard repairs, and courts soft somnus with sweet Lydian airs. Through open casement scans the star-strown deep, and neath Orion's beams sinks off to sleep. Now start from airy dell the elfin train, that dance each midnight o'er the sleeping plain, to bless the just or cast a warning spell on those who dine not wisely, but too well. First Deacon Smith they plague, whose nasal glow comes from what Holmes had called elixir pro. Grouped round the couch, his visage they deride, whilst through his dreams unnumbered serpents glide. Next troop the little folk into the room where snores our young endymion swathed in gloom. A smile lights up his boyish face, whilst he dreams of the moon, or what he ate at tea. The chieftain elf the unconscious youth surveys, and on his form a strange enchantment lays. Those lips that lately thrilled with frosted cake, uneasy sounds in slumberous fashion make. At length their owner's fancies they rehearse, and lisp this awesome poem in blank verse. Omnia resus et omnia pulvis et omnia nile. Demonic clouds uppiled in chasmy reach of soundless heaven smothered the brooding night. Nor came the wanted whisperings of the swamp, nor a voice of autumn wind along the moor nor muttered noises of the insomnious grove whose blank recesses never saw the sun. Within that grove a hideous hollow lies, half bare 
of trees, a pool in center lurks that none dares sound, a tarn of murky face, though naught can prove its hue, since light of day affrighted shuns the forest shadowed banks. Hard by a yawning hillside grotto breathes, from deeps unvisited, a dull, dank air that sears the leaves on certain stunted trees which stand about, clawing the spectral gloom with evil bows. To this accursed dell come woodland creatures, seldom to depart. Once I behold upon the crumbling stone set altar-like before the cave, a thing I saw not clearly, yet from glimpsing fled. In this half-dusk I meditate alone at many a weary noontide, when without a world forgets me in its sun-blessed mirth. Here howl by night the werewolves, and the souls of those that knew me well in other days. Yet on this night the grove spake not to me, nor spake the swamp, nor wind along the moor, nor moaned the wind about the lonely eaves of the bleak, haunted pile wherein I lay. I was afraid to sleep, or quench the spark of the low-burning taper by my couch. I was afraid when through the vaulted space of the old tower, the clock ticks died away into a silence so profound and chill that my teeth chattered, giving yet no sound. Then flickered low the light, and all dissolved, leaving me floating in the hellish grasp of bodied blackness, from whose beating wings came ghoulish blasts of carnal-scented mist. Things vague, unseen, unfashioned, and unnamed jostled each other in the seething void that gaped chaotic downward to a sea of speechless horror, foul with writhing thoughts. All this I felt, and felt the mocking eyes of the cursed universe upon my soul. Yet naught I saw nor heard, till flashed a beam of lurid luster through the rotting heavens. Playing on scenes I labored not to see. Methought the nameless tarn, a light at last, reflected shapes, and more revealed within these shocking depths that ne'er were seen before. Methought from out the cave a demon train, grinning and smirking, reeled in fiendish rout, bearing within their reeking paws a load of carrion vines for an imperious feast. Methought the stunted trees with hungry arms groped greedily for things I dare not name, the while a stifling, wraith-like noisomeness filled all the dale and spoke a larger life of uncorporeal hideousness awake in the half-sentient wholeness of the spot. Now glowed the ground, and tarn, and cave, and trees, and moving forms, and things not spoken of, with such a phosphorescence as men glimpse in the putrescent thickets of the swamp, where logs decaying lie, and rankness reigns. Methought a fire mist draped with lucent fold the well-remembered features of the grove. Whilst whirling ether bore in eddying streams the hot, unfinished stuff of nascent worlds hither and thither through infinities of light and darkness, strangely intermixed, wherein all entity had consciousness, without the accustomed outward shape of life, of these swift circling currents was my soul, free from the flesh, a true constituent part. Nor felt I less myself for want of form, than cleared the mist, and o'er the star-strown scene, divine and measureless, I gazed in awe. Alone in space, I viewed a feeble fleck of silver and light, marking the narrow ken which mortals call the boundless universe. On every side, each as a tiny star, shone more creations vaster than our own, and teeming with unnumbered forms of life. Though we as life would recognize it not, being bound to earthly thoughts of human mold, 
As on a moonless night, the Milky Way in solid sheen displays its countless orbs to weak terrestrial eyes. Each orb a sun, so beamed the prospect on my wandering soul. A spangled curtain, rich with twinkling gems, yet each a mighty universe of suns. But as I gazed, I sensed a spirit voice in speech didactic, though no voice it was, save as it carried thought. It bade me mark that all the universes in my view formed but an atom in infinity, whose reaches past the ether-laden realms of heat and light, extending to far fields where flourish worlds invisible and vague, filled with strange wisdom and uncanny life, and yet beyond to myriad spheres of light to spheres of darkness, to abysmal voids that know the pulses of disordered force. Big with these musings, I surveyed the surge of boundless being, yet I used not eyes, for a spirit leans not on the props of sense. The docent presence swelled my strength of soul, all things I knew, but knew with mind alone. Time's endless vista spread before my thought, with its vast pageant of unceasing change and sepaternal strife of force and will. I saw the ages flow in stately stream, past rise and fall of universe and life. I saw the birth of suns and worlds, their death, their transmutation into limpid flame, their second birth and second death, their course perpetual through the aeon's termless flight. Never the same, yet born again to serve the varying purpose of omnipotence. And whilst I watched, I knew each second space was greater than a lifetime of our world. Then turned my musings to that speck of dust whereon my form corporeal took its rise, that speck born but a second which must die in one brief second more. That fragile earth, that crude experiment, that cosmic sport, which holds our proud, aspiring race of mites in moral vermin. Those presuming mites whom ignorance with empty pomp adorns and misinstructs in spacious dignity. Those mites who, reasoning outward, vaunt themselves as the chief work of nature and enjoy in fatuous fancy the particular care of all her mystic, superregnant power. And as I strove to vision the sad sphere which lurked, lost in ethereal vortices, methought my soul turned to the infinite, refused to glimpse that poor atomic blight, that misbegotten accident of space, that globe of insignificance, whereon dwells no part of Empyrean virtue, but where breed the coarse corruptions of divine disease, the festering ailments of infinity, the morbid matter by itself called man. Such matter as oft breaks forth on broad creation's fabric, to annoy for a brief instant, ere assuaging death, heal up the malady its birth provoked. Sickened, I turned my heavy thoughts away. Then spake the ethereal guide with mocking mien, upbraiding me for searching after truth, visiting on my mind and searching scorn of mind superior, laughing at the woe which rent the vital essence of my soul. Methought he brought remembrance of the time when from my fellows to the grove I strayed in solitude and dusk to meditate on forbidden things and to pierce the veil of seeming good and seeming beauteousness that covers o'er the tragedy of truth, helping mankind forget his sorry lot and raising hope where truth would crush it down. He spake, and as he ceased, Methought the flames of fuming heaven resolved in torments dire, whirling in maelstroms of rebellious might. Yet ever bound by laws I fathomed not, 
cycles and epicycles of such girth that each a cosmos seemed dazzled my gaze till all a wild phantasmal glow became. Now burst athwart a fulgent formlessness, a rift of pure sheen, a sight supernal, broader, that all the void conceived by man yet narrow here. A glimpse of heavens beyond, of weird creations so remote and great, that even my guide assumed a tone of awe. Born on the wings of stark immensity, a touch of rhythm celestial reached my soul, thrilling me more with horror than with joy. Again the spirit mocked my human pangs, and deep reveled me for presumptuous thoughts. Yet changing now his mien, he bade me scan the winding rift that clave the walls of space. He bade me search it for the ultimate. He bade me find the truth I sought so long. He bade me brave the unutterable thing, the final truth of moving entity. All this he bade and offered, but my soul, clinging to life, fled without aim or knowledge, shrieking in silence through the gibbering deeps. Thus shrieked the young Lucullus as he fled through gibbering deeps and tumbled out of bed. Within the room the morning sunshine gleams, whilst the poor youth recalls his troubled dreams. He feels his aching limbs, whose woeful pain informs his soul his body lives again. And thanks his stars, or cosmoses, or such, that he survives the noxious nightmare's clutch. Thrilled with the music of the eternal spheres, or is that the alarm clock that he hears? He vows to all the pantheon, high and low, no more to feed on cake, or pie, or po. And now his gloomy spirits seem to rise, as he the world beholds with clearer eyes. The cup he thought too full of dregs to quaff, affords him wine enough to raise a laugh. All this a metaphor, you must not think, our late endymion prone to stronger drink. With brighter visage and with lighter heart, he turns his fancies to the grocer's mart. And strange to say, at last he seems to find his daily duties worthy of his mind. Since truth proved such a high and dangerous goal, our bard seeks one less trying to his soul. With deep-drawn breath he flouts his dreary woes, and a good clerk from a bad poet grows. Now close attend my lay, ye scribbling crew, that bay the moon in numbers strange and new, that madly for the spark celestial ball in meters short or long or none at all. Curb your rash force in numbers or at T, nor overzealous for high fancies be. Reflect, ere ye the draught period take, what worthy clerks or plumbers ye might make. Wax not too frenzied on the leaping line that neither sense nor measure can confine, lest ye, like young Lucullus languish, groan, beneath poetic nightmares of your own. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this reading, please subscribe so that you may hear the next one to come along. If you have any tales you would like me to read, let me know down in the comments below. Have a wonderful day.